Welcome, everyone. I think those who've turned up so far have all moved into the auditorium, so that, that's great. Uh, my name is Susan Pond, and I have the honour of being president of the Royal Society of New South Wales and to chair this Four Societies lecture and introduce our speaker, Vince de Pietro. Uh, first, I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which the State Library of New South Wales stands, and I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging, and possibly in this audience. Welcome to everyone else here tonight, uh, representing four societies, the Royal Society of New South Wales, Engineers Australia, Sydney Division, and more specifically its Nuclear Engineering Panel, the Australian Nuclear Association and the Australian Institute of Energy. I also acknowledge and thank Academy Travel, also represented here tonight, uh, who is our sponsor for this event. And as you will have found on your seats, there's a flyer for a visit to Italy, uh, Renaissance Revisited, which will be led by our speaker, Vince de Pietro, next year. Now, it's interesting, interesting to review the history of how this eclectic group of four societies started to host the Four Societies Lecture. And it seems that it came about by serendipity. Our society, the Royal Society's uh, council meeting on the 26th of September 1990 read, it was agreed that Dr. Peace, FRS, visiting professor at the University of New South Wales, will be asked to address the society on a topic of his choosing on the 13th or 20th of February in 1991 in the Hallstrom Theatre at the Australian Museum. The next council, uh, minutes on the 31st of October read, it was noted that Mr Ford would arrange for Dr Peace to give his talk at a joint meeting of engineering and nuclear societies, including the Royal Society of New South Wales and the Institution of Engineers. And the November council minutes read, Mr Ford informed the council that arrangements had been made for Dr Peace to talk at a joint meeting of the institution's of Engineers Australia Sydney Division, Nuclear Engineering Panel, Royal Society of New South Wales, Australian Nuclear Association and the Australian Institute of Energy. So hence the Four Societies Lecture was born. Uh, Randall Sebastian Peace, FRS, was an eminent British physicist, I'm sure known to some of you at least, from Cambridge University. He strongly opposed nuclear weapons while advocating the use of nuclear fusion as a clean source of power. As we all know, that story is still unfolding. His lecture was held on the 12th of February 1991 in Eagle House, the premises of the then Institute of Engineers in Milsons Point. His topic, Nuclear Fusion Power, Prospective Economic and Environmental Aspects, some comparisons. So we can surmise that Dr. Peace was so eminent, and he was, that everyone wanted to hear him speak, and thus the joint meeting resulted, and has become a regular in the annual calendar of the four societies, each of which hosts a lecture on a rotating basis every four years. The last one that the Royal Society hosted was in this auditorium, was the last lecture that the Society held before we all got closed down by the pandemic. The lectures over the years have mainly covered topics related to energy and energy generation, nuclear energy in the early years, but later broadened considerably to cover geothermal energy, solar energy, energy storage and generation of energy from waste. And this year we take a step further into the subject that Vince is going to cover, resilience before readiness for the want of a horseshoe nail. I won't steal Vince's spotlight any further. 
But who better to address us on this subject than Vince de Pietro A.M. from Shoalhaven on the south coast of New South Wales and fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales. During and after the Karawan bushfire, Vince was the local recovery coordinator for the Shoalhaven City Council, overseeing a recovery of the damage sustained by 82% of the Shoalhaven's 4,600 square kilometres. Having learned much during the fire emergency, Vince went on to design, coordinate and implement the Recovery into Resilience project in the Shoalhaven. This project was delivered on time and on budget in October last year and is now fully operational at 26 community information hubs that are powered by solar and battery and connected via a satellite system. Before those pieces of work, Vince served in the Royal Australian Navy for 40 years, specialising in aviation, flight training, professional military education, international diplomacy, risk management, certification and safety. I first met him in 2014 when he was commander of the Navy's fleet air arm based in now, and I was on a delegation with colleagues from the Academy of Technology and Engineering. We had a long discussion about our respective work with the US Navy on renewable aviation and shipping fuels. On his retirement from the Navy, Vince was appointed Chief Executive of Lockheed Martin and New in Australia and New Zealand until April 2019, and he is now an independent consultant and still very busy, as you will have gathered. So to echo the title of this presentation tonight, I can say that Vince calls a spade a spade, and I look forward to our robust Q&A after his presentation, which will be conducted by Robert Clancy, who's a fellow of the Society and uh, well known to many of you. Vince, welcome to the lectern. Well, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, that's, that was a very generous and uh, kind introduction. And um, can I just say to all of you, good evening. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight and to uh, perhaps shine a light from slightly different perspectives on things which, uh, which I've come to know and learn, funnily enough, more recently and most since leaving the service than the 40 years in it. The first and essential disclaimer is to emphasise <clears throat> that I'm a simple military pilot and not an academic or an engineer. Put simply, I'm feeling a bit like a speck of cosmic dust in a room full of planets. However, I'm keen to share a practitioner's perspective of dots that I believe need to be joined better <clears throat> and hope that this evening's short presentation will stimulate discussion and thought. I'm ready for divergent opinion and welcome the same. Second, the title of the presentation is worthy of some elaboration to set the tone. I have purposely tried to avoid making this about my comfort zone and defence. As experience tells me that the second defence is, is raised, conversation immediately gravitates to hardware, the toys and capabilities, bringing out the general in all of us. Our time this evening will be better spent understanding that if we manage and treat the vulnerabilities, the threats will look after themselves. And that is so much wider a discussion, although admittedly not as sexy, as ships, tanks, submarines, jet fighters and helicopters. The more resilient we are in the present, the more ready we will be to tackle any challenges in the future. Now to that end, defence is a reflection of the community it is there to serve, and if the community is underprepared or lacking in resilience, then the readiness of our nation and its defence force is not assured. The era of compartmentalising topics into pillars of excellence is well and truly over. Almost everything that we experience or hear about or the policies that run it is joined at the hip to numerous other matters and they can't be compartmentalised. You cannot stop or accurately predict what the future will bring, but we can all be better prepared for it. Now, a definition of resilience that I like to use is that of the United Nations. <clears throat> resilience is the ability of any individual, community or nation to return to near normal condition after any perturbation. To be ready for those perturbations that upset 
our balance or normal, we must be resilient as we can in the present. So what has that got to do with it? a horseshoe nail? And just about now I see some of you probably getting ready to get up and go to dinner, but please stick around for a minute. For the want of a horse, or the, the, the expression goes something like this, and it's a very old and from biblical times, but more recently Benjamin Franklin quoted it a few times. For the want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of the horse, the warrior was lost. For the loss of the warrior, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Seemingly unimportant acts or omissions, blind adherence to policy or practice that works well enough in the present, with no understanding or consciousness of spitballing the future, or a failure to understand the necessity of second and third order consequence, have, can have grave and unforeseen consequences. Fragile or poor community resilience has grave consequences for our natural readiness. So it was in the black summer bushfires of 2019 and 2020 when nature seemed to declare war on we humans. So the Karawin bushfire, which attacked, go to the right machine. So the Karawin bushfire, which attacked Shoalhaven, damaged or destroyed 80 to 82 percent of the 4,600 square kilometre area. From the dry lightning strike on the 27th of November 2019 until being declared extinguished 74 days later on the 8th of February 2020. This is a very simple infographic. It's available online on the Shoalhaven City Council's website, but effectively that is the borders of the Shoalhaven City. Everything which is shaded in the dark grey was pretty well destroyed. 20% of the Shoalhaven is designed for human habitation and development. 82% was damaged. The 2% of the developed area which was damaged took with it over 300 houses and a whole bunch of other stuff. Most importantly of which, believe it or not, is the second to bottom line, which is 4,200 beehives. Why is that important? Because if you're trying to regenerate a forest after something like this, if you've got something that, if you're lacking the thing that pollinates, then you've got, a, you've got an uphill battle. <clears throat> the repair and the recovery was extensive and it went from beehives to bridges and everything in the middle. And again on the infographic, if you go to the Shoalhaven website, you can see the length and breadth of what it is we had to do and the, and, the, and the resources that we had to do it and to have achieved it in less than effectively six months since the extinguishing, extinguishment of the fire was nothing short of miraculous and I can't speak highly enough of the people who put their backs to the grindstone to do it. So what did it look like? Well, <clears throat> the day that strikes fear in my heart was New Year's Eve on 2019. That was the day where some might recall Lake Conjola and Conjola Park were uh, seriously hit. Uh, Yatta Yatta was also taken out. And uh, not three days after that, a very serious wind heading our way was then uh, had a wind shift to the south. And, um, <clears throat> and up it went straight up through Kangaroo, sorry, to a northerly wind, and up it went through to uh, Kangaroo Valley and took out another 120 houses. But this was sunrise on uh, New Year's Eve in 2019. About um, <clears throat> six hours later, at 11.29 on the same day, this is taken from the balcony window of, or the balcony door of our bedroom, looking south, and you can see a nice fresh strike there of, uh, of, uh, of, of smoke and heat. About an hour later, it looked like that, and we could start feeling, really feeling the heat from that and the smoke was starting to get uh, a little bit uh, less than comfortable. Then, only a couple of hours after that, it looked like this. And that was at three o'clock in the afternoon. It was, as, it was as dark as any night. That was street lights on and the reason the photo is blurred is because I couldn't hold the phone long enough for the six seconds it took for the exposure. And then all those years of naval training, including three years as the naval attaché to the United States, kicked in and did what we, the only thing that any sensible person could do is to gather all our elderly neighbours on the driveway and toast in the new year. No pun intended. Hasn't changed. But, so that was New Year's Eve. So what did it look like when all of that cleared? So this was a couple of scenes. It was really a lunar landscape. In some parts of Sassafras, the heat was so intense and the damage done to the root systems of the eucalyptus forests was complete and thorough. So even when it was out, you could be standing on patches of earth up near Budjong and you could actually hear the fire still under the ground crackling in, under your feet. Now this is a photo on the left taken just near Sassafras on Route 92, just short of um, 
of Neriga. And on the right hand side is a photo of the uh, Princess Highway just south of Ulladulla. So that was on the 15th of January when we were pretty well close to putting the thing out and we were just trying to work out where do you start. And then literally within a week from that, on Australia Day of the 2020, we started seeing what we call the gloves or the, the, or the socks, which are the little sprig, sprigs of life leaping out of what looked to be, for all intents and purposes, black sticks. And uh, to think that that was happening literally within two weeks of the, of the fire having uh, gone through there really does say a lot about the resilience of nature, if it can survive that sort of perturbation. This is an interesting picture. <clears throat> For those that are uh, old enough to remember, that you might recall there was a significant hangar fire in Nowra in Christmas of 1975, where 816 and 851 squadrons, S2G trackers, were destroyed in, uh, in the fire, and nine machines, nine of this aircraft's brothers or siblings, were, uh, were completely destroyed in the heat. This aircraft was the only one that survived that hangar fire in Christmas 1975. When they were decommissioned from active service in 1984, a bloke up on Nara Hill bought it and stuck it in his front paddock, which happens to be that bit of earth you can see there. Now, the interesting thing is that that airframe survived the fire in its own hangar in 1975, and then on the great fires of 2019, 2020, literally survived the bushfire that took everything around it. If we ever go to war, I want to be in that machine. <laughs> So, and as the fire went out, the concurrent emergency of COVID-19 took off with ferocity. From December 2019 to July 2020, it was a privilege and honour to be asked to assist as the local recovery coordinator in a voluntary capacity at first, and then to stay on a bit longer, and chair the local recovery committee. On completion of the recovery, I was then fortunate to catch the selector's eye for a $2 million bushfire local economic recovery fund grant to build the recovery into resilience system or project. This was born of the most pressing need throughout all of that activity that I've just shown you, which was an inability to communicate with the community in times of severe stress, and for the community to have timely, accurate and authoritative information year round. I'll take some time to describe this because I'm very proud of what was achieved. I'm delighted that with such little money we were able to achieve it, but more importantly, just to walk you through the philosophy and just to give you a little snapshot of what that project looks like in terms of end product in the Shoalhaven. So the philosophy of the project, very simply, is three pillars of work. Work stream one on your, on your left was community-led resilience, which we did in, com in company with uh, Professor Darrell Lo Choi from Griffith University. And that was community-driven workshops, just what do you want the future to look like? <coughs> Staff members from council in the room negotiating and working this through with the public and the community so that we could actually bring the expectations of community to understand what the restrictions of budget and time and, and available cap capability in the council actually looks like as well. We came up with four amazing publications and they are now very much living documents. The middle column was community readiness, where we put out a bunch of really important but very simple two A4 pages all the way through the printed media, uh, newspapers and the like around all the council offices in the city and also inside individual rate notices and we distributed 40,000 copies of those. The third pillar was the bit that I really, really got excited about, was the local information hub. And that's where, if you go to the top line, the notion that sociology with a sensible use of available technology, not off the shelf stuff, not um, you know, science experiment stuff, but off the shelf stuff, actually helps you improve and build a resilience which you otherwise were unable to achieve and proven to unable to achieve it during the disaster. So what do they look like? That's uh, the community information hub at the entrance to the Booteree National Park in Jarvis Bay. 450,000 cars a year drive past that sign. It's a very simple 55-inch Samsung information screen or digital information screen, which is powered by the sun through a battery, a Tesla Powerwall 2 battery, which runs at 13.5 kilowatts of stored energy. And, um, and the communication to that particular screen is through a satellite modem from the NBN business satellite using beam 42, 54 and 59, directly above our head, year round, geostationary orbit, transmitting playlists of up to 28 slides and five minutes worth of information. And we're doing that across 26 sites. Example here, this was Anzac Day last year at the Greenwell Point Hub, where literally there's a, hub on, there's a screen on the outside, a screen on the inside of the hall, and they can be remotely monitored, turned on, turned off, and information of, of interest being transmitted to each of those places, either collectively as a whole city or individually to each place as its own channel. 
The right hand screen is an example of another sort of mount that we used, which was at the Shoalhaven, sorry, at the uh, Ulladulla Library. The reason the mounts are so important is because these were all fabricated, manufactured, powder coated in the south coast in Nowra by South Coast Glass. And so the one in the middle is actually a lockable cabinet, which is bug proof, fire proof, theft proof, weather proof, and we've proven all of them. And, um, and it, it literally houses the screen, which forms the outer door. Samsung is very interested to, to have our drawings for it. We're kind of keen that they come up with some other ideas. But nonetheless, the hubs themselves, there are 26 of them across the community, where? At all of these blue dots. And each of the hubs very simply has the solar panels feeding a battery. The battery then has a, a connection into the power board, which has an essential load circuit. And the essential load circuit at all the Shoalhaven City Council owned amenities now runs the following. Emergency escape signs, lighting, ventilation, two general purpose outlets, one refrigerator, two 55 inch Samsung information screens, a satellite modem, the comms rack and a voice over IP telephone, a two way telephone that just works over the internet protocol and is there active and ready to use in any, to, to call anybody on the planet. And all of that is run using a very simple five gigabyte per month contract through Pivotel where we literally just run the playlists year round on what we call the blue screen of happiness for normal, normal times. And if it's less than normal times, I'm about to show you what that looks like in an emergency mode. So Shoalhaven Community Information Involvement has been amazing. We actually have one of the screens on the playlist as a QR code, which you can go up to and just walk up to and, and click take a photo and it'll take you straight to the content manager in the council who will then prepare the slide and put it up while you're still on the phone. And we've had things advertised on there from tea cosy competitions to walking the dog to the new Jerry Bailey toilet block in Shoalhaven Heads and all sorts of things in the middle. But the take up was extraordinary. As of the 19th of December, 393 members of the public had used it. In other words, taken a picture, can you put up our particular local notice please? And, and we affected it. So what do the playlist samples look like? This is the sort of stuff we put up. Each one of these is a page which some, somewhere appeared during the, uh, during the, the life of the, um, of, the, uh, of the activity. And there are all sorts of things from shows, volunteering for Meals on Wheels, Red Cross, maritime services, um, uh, advertising, you know, the screening of the Inferno movie in the Huskisson Cinema, um, you know, local plays, uh, you getting the idea? Annual show days, it's just about continuous flow of authoritative, accurate and timely information for the community. You can't advertise on it, and believe me, there was a lot of pressure to say, why can't we just put the odd, you know, Bandmaster Bob or the Fish and Chip Shop? Because the second you start giving priority to anybody who's paid for time, you then having to compromise the, qual the quality and the content of what you can put up for the community. So the $2 million project included a three-year subscription with all of the comms gear so that this now runs effectively at no cost to the, to the, uh, to the Shoalhaven other than the operator to, to load the slides. Anzac Day, we were able to put down each channel what was happening in their particular location and uh, you get the drift. It's, uh, I love it. It really floats my boat. In an emergency time, when we go from the blue screen of happiness, and the reason I say that, top right-hand corner of the screen is a time Bottom left hand corner of the screen is a real date. Now this is just a, a slide that's running at the Nara show, uh, showground which is just talking about which bin do I use. And for exercise we want to go to an emergency mode at that screen where we want to put either a watch and act or an alert notice or an evacuation notice. Example. We go from blue to red. Now because the screen is in red, the disclaimer under where it says watch and act actually says that every information you're seeing on this screen now has been issued with the authority of the local emergency operational controller, so the chief of police. So what you're seeing now is real. Don't question it. If it says watch and act, if it says evacuate, this is an executive order under the section 44 activation of, a, of, a, of an emergency. This is an amber screen, so watch and act. We can go to red, which is emergency warning. And these are just samples, of course. People in Tomorong Basin, get ready to evacuate. If you want to know more and the phones are up and running, because they may not be, you can QR code that and it'll take you straight to the RFS page of what you need to know. Exit via the Princess Highway, example, or back to blue. And we can do that in 92 seconds remotely from any laptop which has that software anywhere on the planet. So 
you can see why I'm a bit, bit proud of it. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the country. I have briefed three federal ministers. I'm just hoping they take, a, take my serious invitation to consider rolling this thing out nationally. These 26 hubs, plus all the work that went in Pillars 1 and 2, was $2 million. We've paid over $50 million for feasibility studies of whether you can even do it. Right, enough emotion. Get back into it. So, this four-year window was tremendous. As much as for the ability to be able to help as for the visibility it gave me to the challenges facing my own regional and rural home-based community of 40 years plus, having arrived in Nara in 1978 as a midshipman pilot. I had until then enjoyed a relatively protected existence within the Defence Force for 40 years in uniform, followed by three years in defence industry in a suit. Tonight I'd like to stimulate thought and discussion about community resilience as the most important element of national readiness, and what I believe to be essential to build the resilience needed to achieve readiness. I'm going to do it in three tranches. The first is regional and rural power and communications. The second is policy, bureaucracy and community. And the third is the essential role of academia. The first, power and communications. What was the effect witnessed during the fire and the recovery effort running in parallel? During the fire, we had some extraordinary scenes and happenings which would challenge even the world's most vivid fiction author's imagination. From thousands of people waiting on a beach in the shallows praying to be evacuated from the sea by the Navy and merchant ships, to long lines of parked vehicles with summer holiday makers awaiting all the all clear to drive in either direction on the only highway, the Prince's Highway, to uh, in or out and away from the potential harm all around them. And whole hamlets and communities connected to that same and only highway by basically nothing more than single driveway size roads in and out and mostly cut off by the fire. And during all of it was the significant deficiency of the power grid and the mobile phone network. Something as benign as filling a car with petrol. If you could get to a Bowser, chances were the power was out and you couldn't pump it. If you could pump it, you couldn't pay for it because the phone network was, was down and with it FPOS. Most likely, both were not available due to the fire damaging infrastructure of power, water communications, many, many kilometres away from where the effects were being felt. The reliance on social media, Facebook in particular, to get any information about what was happening was as problematic as it was helpful if indeed it was working as it too relies on the mobile phone network. ABC Radio Illawarra provided extraordinary and continuous advice on 97.3 FM as information from any source reached the continuously on-duty announcers. Apps providing emergency information were only as accurate as the latest confirmed and verified updates and then only if the mobile phone network was available. Cashless society? Not just yet. Put simply, we were able to communicate with or be contacted by the many hamlets and villages down the length of the coast and into the southern highlands, sorry, we were unable to co communicate with or be contacted by the many hamlets and villages down the length of the coast and into the southern highlands at Kangaroo Valley or across the hinterland that separates the coast from the magnificent pristine canyons and gorges. Equally, we were unable to advise specific areas of the status of their areas and communities and they in turn were unable to provide any feedback or intelligence or on-site observation back to us to assist combat agencies who were so widely spread across the expanse of the city and the region. I offer some thoughts of the causes generating the experiences during the recovery and since. Telecommunications provides a worthy starting discussion. If there is no return on investment, there is little hope of seeing investment, be it in infrastructure or services. The foundation of many investment decisions, apart from that which is presented for tender, is also the population data required during census nights. In the case of the Shoalhaven, the population in August is about 102,000. In the summer months, this expands many fold as caravan parks and holiday rentals become fully booked and occupied. The first casualty is available mobile phone telephone, mobile telephone bandwidth. And restrictions on using non-terrestrial solutions during the project to resolve this in the Shoalhaven required compliance with the Telecommunications Act and competition rules, which had to be referred through a telco that had no space-based offering. Is there room for improvement, particularly in access and services to our comparatively sparsely populated regions across significant and large distances? I think there is. Power. Here comes the Kevlar blit, because I know there's a lot of people in the room who are knowledgeable about 
uh, in our sibling societies about energy and power, but here goes. There are three essential elements that must be in equal tension, in my view, if the resolution of how we generate energy for our nation is to be resolved. It's like a three-legged bar stool. These three legs are causal risk, customer demand, and system ownership. First, causal risk. Without mitigating risks, the effects will remain the same. If you keep doing the same things, you can't expect different outcomes. In the last fortnight, Melbourne and Gippsland experienced the most devastating effect of severe storm activity, not fire or inundation, but mostly unprecedented winds. Half a million homes without power, 11,000 of those homes without power six days later, and 5,000 to the day before yesterday still without power. Western Australia is experiencing devastating bushfire that penetrated urban areas deeper than ever before. With all that going on in the world, with all, with all that's going on in the world, ABC Radio National AM, only the day before yesterday, had its lead item as a dedicated segment on how to stand and travel through and negotiate lightning storms. Is there a link? We can't speak of power or energy production in isolation from the rapidly expanding envelope of extreme weather events and their hideous aftermath. The primary causal factor is that the weather is changing. Regrettably, the earlier descriptors of global warming and its softer replacement climate change firmly entrenched into the political arena the causal factor of rapidly changing weather extremes. I say regrettable because in my view as a risk manager, the changing weather should be dealt with not as a political football thriving on community division, but as a discussion of risk and how to mitigate it. Is there any possibility that humans are creating avoidable risk to the environment? Is human interaction with the environment generating the environment's response in ways which appear like the environment seemingly is declaring war on we humans? We are and will continue to experience more frequent and devastating effects. We are also facing a challenge to forecast it accurately in spite of the decades of data behind predictive modelling that led to a significant reduction in the number of weather forecasters. Having been involved in aviation for over 47 years and still in current flying practice to this day, I am an avid watcher and in interpreter of synoptic charts. One pattern I've never seen the likes of previously was in the last New Year's Eve, sorry, last Boxing Day, and it looked like this. This is taken from the same driveway where the elderly neighbours were having a drink on New Year's Eve four years previously. On the left you'll see a bolt of lightning, a single bolt, about 47 seconds later, and this was at 20 past five on the afternoon of uh, Boxing Day, there's about six lightning strikes simultaneously hitting the ground. It was dry storms, there was no water attached. And funnily enough, both those impacts were round about the same place that went up with, with a spontaneous fire on New, uh, New Year's Eve in 2019. But then, being an avid watcher of synoptic charts, I went to my Oz Runway software package, which I get all my current information and NOTAMs on before getting airborne, and what I saw was this at 6pm. This is a picture of the eastern seaboard of Australia starting above and to the north of New Guinea, all the way down to the top right hand corner of Tasmania. That is a continuous and unbroken line of electrical storm activity simultaneously at that time. So okay, you say, all right, we're not going to New Zealand for a holiday, we'll go to Perth today. Let's have a look at what the left hand half of this picture looked like. That starts at Singapore, across the whole Asian Ar um, Indonesian archipelago, Borneo, bits of Malaysia, enters Australia at Wyndham and leaves it at Esperance. And that was simultaneously at 6pm uh, 6 on Boxing Day 2023. There isn't a military force on the planet that could put that much energy across that area at simultaneously. Now, we have all sorts of names to throw into the discussion to almost a swap. Oh, by the way, let's go back to that. How do I go back? I was going to say something about submarines because um, 
in the right-hand picture, you can see why it makes a lot of sense to put the submarines on the west coast, because they're closer to where they need to be. But anyway, um, now we have all sorts of names to throw into the discussion to almost assuage our concerns that we are having no effect on the climate and that this normal, because the weather has always been changing, is just the, state, that's the way it is. There is in our media an endless explanation for the diversity of manifestation we are experiencing daily. Indo-Pacific warm water pool doubling in size, Indian Ocean Earth Dipole, El Nino, El Nino, Southern Isolation, Intertropical Convergence Zone, East Australian Current, and so on. And so are we being lulled into a sense of, of there being nothing to see here? Our second leg of energy, the energy bar school, is demand. Why do we need more than we currently have, and why can't we just continue to do on our present path and do more of the same and just burn it until the coal runs out? We need alternative sources of energy generation and storage for one simple reason. Demand is outstripping supply by many orders of magnitude in some places, and this is logically why energy is so expensive and will get more so even as coal is as cheap as it's been for some time. What we are doing now is not enough to meet demand in the future, and if coupled to the potential of what we are doing may be damaging the environment and adversely affecting the climate, then isn't the sensible human, human condition to do it smarter? And the aggre aggregation of all that we do, because there is no single silver bullet, must meet demand and mitigate any possible risk we may be generating by our own greenhouse emissions, and those for which we may be contributors, albeit not being generated on our shores. Yet, with the very immature discussion remaining in the political domain, we can never achieve a logical outcome. As a pretty simple pilot, I did some digging into some better understand this. This slide, which is a bit premature, but nonetheless, wind farms and wind turbines are ugly as are solar farms. Yet this is just one open cut coal mine on the left. That's about 800 square kilometres, about two and a quarter hours from where we're sitting right now, up at the northern end of the Hunter Valley. And I can assure you, the bits that have been claimed to be remediated will never see anything grow on them again. And these holes are very, very deep. You could fly a very light aircraft down into them and fly back out the other side. They're that long. And for some reason, we're being led to, to believe or be convinced that what's on the right is any uglier than that on the left. Similarly, headlines that solar will reduce the agricultural land availability. But before we get to that, that's a little bit closer look. The top, the top picture shows two, two pits which are actually remediated at the very top, uh, top of the left-hand picture. The rest of it's all active and live. That's the solar farm which is at Urala, the first phase of the solar farm at Urala near Armadale. Now headlines that solar will reduce the agricultural land availability. Why? Can't they operate in unison? So there's, there's an agricultural high school in Tamworth in Barnaby Joyce's electorate where what they've done is they've put their panels at a 2.5 metre pedestal and the cows can continue to graze underneath it. And in fact, in some instances, they use it for shade. If you have a look on the right, that is a flock of sheep which is discovered if you stand in the shadow of the windmill, you actually don't die from heat stress while you're growing wool. On the left is paddocks full of sheep in the close proximity of wind turbines. That's in northern New South Wales. Now, I'm not naive enough to say that, sure, it must be producing some error or some damage to things like flocks of birds. But having said that, there is technology which can actually get you to slow or stop the turbine. There is technology which will detect that sort of level of migration. There is technology which will allow you to use science to protect the wildlife if it is so programmed to do. <coughs> so. What else can we say about what we're producing and why it's not meeting the task? Well, what we used to be done by a 60 watt, I beg your pardon, similar, similar uh, trials have been, gone, have been undergone in uh, the University of Minnesota, where they've literally produced some incredible statistics on how much energy can be produced while growing dairy cattle and the farm production of, of harvested energy, not only paying for the operation of the dairy farm, but actually providing a significant subsidy in what it sells back to the grid. These things can operate if we just want to think laterally. And we've got to get the emotion out of the argument. We've got to start seeing what people can actually think about and do. What used to be done by a 60 watt light globe is now pretty well done by a whole bunch of stuff. So there's a 60 watt light globe. You might remember they used to come in a cardboard packet at the supermarket. They're about $1.20 each. 
everything in that is totally recyclable. The glass, the wire, the, uh, the copper or the, uh, or the aluminium in the base, totally recyclable. Everything on the right, $34 at Aldi, none of it can be treated outside landfill. Now, admittedly, okay, but it's 60 watts versus 18 watts, but let's go a little bit further into this. Our kitchen used to have two 30-watt fluorescent tubes, 60 watts total, or if you like, the same as one light bulb. And I'll put there Pops and Grand, just to make sure that we get the timing right. Now, what we have is boxes that are nine watts a piece, none of it recyclable except the box, and if we look at our own kitchen right now, what used to be run by two fluorescent tubes, and it wasn't, it wasn't attractive, I mean, it was stark light, I admit that. But now we've got seven watts, seven nine watt bulbs, which total 63 watts, which is more than the fluoros that it replaced, and I haven't started to add or count in the amounts of strip lights that we have inside the pantries, inside the cupboards, inside special cabinets, all for effect and mood. I have a model collection in a room in my backyard, <coughs> I can't tell you how much energy that uses, but it's a darn sight more than six bulbs in my mum's dining room chandelier. So, what I'm trying to say there is an overshadowing all of this is the discussion of whether we should stay with coal or move to solar or wind or nuclear or hydrogen or more hydro and, and the speed of the internet and the veracity of social media and the growing reliance on AI has lulled us into thinking that these things can all be done at the flick of a switch ignoring the significant engineering and time involved to achieve it. So as well as what we need, the money to do it and the model used to secure the money is fundamental, which brings me to the third leg of the, bar leg of the bar stool, ownership. Stand by. The fervour with which the economic teachings of Keynes and Friedman were embraced in Australia may offer key insights where we might improve our resilience in the future. When times are good, demand may create the supply all of its own. But in such a small population and a market as well as is Australia, this has proven to not be as sustainable as it is in large, more highly populated and industrial capable manufacturing economies. When coupled to our long-standing strategic dependence on big and powerful friends and dependence on foreign investment, the shortfalls reverberate all the way to the most technologically advanced capabilities and our abilities to own and operate them. And now I'm really am very close to getting into the defence tent, so I'll back out a bit. But it is essential to appreciate that these shortfalls begin as horseshoe nails. I believe this was most evident during the fires and the concurrent emergency of COVID-19 and the very serious shortcomings of global supply chains for the simplest of items, fuel reserves, foods and medicines. If I am an investor, how will I achieve progressive return on investment for, for the period between contract and product? How long will it take? Science and engineering understand the time and what's involved very clearly. What is needed is informed leadership, giving clear direction and then able to pack it, wrap it and sell it. Regrettably, again, in the political domain, we do the announceable first and worry about the detail later. Great example of that in the last 24 hours. I'm not suggesting that government must own everything, but if resilience and in turn our nation's readiness is to be improved we need to be engaged and encouraging our nation's leadership to measure and assess the national strategic needs, plan wisely and retain control at the very least and ownership at best of more than it currently owns. We are seeing deficiencies daily of services and national capabilities waning or unable to be satisfied and the regions are affected so much more obviously and on a much larger, larger scale than are the cities. Let's just talk briefly about policy bureaucracy and the community. During the fire, we set up the Ulladulla Recovery Centre in the Civic Centre in Ulladulla. What that was was the main hall auditorium where there were about 28 booths set up with a table, chairs, two sides where you could interview, connectivity, internet, all that stuff set up. And the idea of it was that you went to this place and you registered and you were able to seek assistance from land services, from Red Cross, from mental health agencies, all sorts of things. And bearing in mind, this was, this was covering people that had lost everything. They were literally in what they stood in. We were visited on, that, on a day shortly after this thing opened by three very important people, Commissioner, uh, Police Commissioner uh, Mick Willing 
uh, Brigadier Garrigan from 6RAR up in Queensland, and uh, Federal Police Commissioner uh, Andrew Colvin. And I said to the leader of the recovery centre, the manager of the recovery centre, I says, I'm not, I'm not going to brief them. I want you to take them in here as if they are affected people just coming, having come just off the fire ground. She goes, oh, okay. Within about seven minutes, Commissioner Colvin came back to me and said, we've got a problem. I said, yeah, can you see it? The problem was that when you arrived, it wasn't like going to the deli where you pull out D21 and someone says, what's your name, address and phone number? The problem was that before they could even talk to you from each of these different government departments, you had to register. So you could spend up to five or six hours in that place registering 28 times and walking out with not a single thing that you needed when you walked in. And why? Because of privacy provisions. Government departments with individual requirements and needs needing their own signature or their own signed form before they could proceed with their work. So in effect, what we had done is we'd converted the laptop into a quill and ledger because we weren't using technology to advantage. And that was at the expense of people's well-being and psychological well-being in particular. So you dig deeper into the RoboDebt Royal Commission findings and you find exactly the same outcome. Automated systems that are focused on individual application and repetition of registration data. Dr Darren O'Donovan of La Trobe University says, instead of registering once and everybody behind the scenes checking twice, you have to register every single time. Now that is not beyond the wit of humankind to resolve. It's not that difficult. But for some reason, it just seems to be beyond us. I won't go into the details of the cleanup after the fire where you had to opt in rather than opt out. So if you had 10 people saying, yes, please start bulldozing my land, and one, one person in the street couldn't be found, the whole work stopped. Whereas if you'd said, hey, look, Friday next week we're coming in with a couple of bulldozers, and that's a military solution, I admit. Friday we're coming in with a bunch of bulldozers, make sure you get everything you want off it before that, because we're taking it all with us. But we couldn't do that. So why? Well, because very much, everything is very much influenced by criticism, social media in particular. Political outcomes drive bureaucracy to be focused on process rather than outcome. In Australia, there is little tolerance for error or failure, and hence social media backlash leads to risk aversion, not avoidance. In turn, this drives a perception of outsourcing risk as a risk reduction tool. In practice, however, while outsourcing profits, reliance on contracts with little or no physical supervision or compliance checking transfers real financial risk back onto the taxpayer through government. Examples in the last days, asbestos contaminated mulch, centenary towers, cyber attacks. Conventional wisdom is that any change or suggestion needs more money and more people. The real inference, sorry, the real interface between people in the first tier of government is in the local government areas. Now there are 128 local government areas in New South Wales of which about 100 are in some level of difficulty and financial difficulty. In my own city of the Shoalhaven, we have recently been involved in discussions about raising rates by as high as 44% in one year to meet the budget deficit. This may address the effect, but will certainly not be sufficient to stop the cause. Funding is clearly a part of the problem, but are local government areas the right shape and size? Does form follow function? Are we using technology to its fullest extent and exploiting its potential labour-saving potential, or are we doing things the same way as we've always done them, and therefore requiring more humans in particular, which are the first casualty in productivity targets, thereby increasing the constipation of the process even further? Are we using whatever is available to mobilise and empower great resilience? How are we placed to use the enormous talent pool of, dare I say, older people who know how to don a hard hat and fluoro vest and a clipboard to go out and check? Is self-regulation and outsource certification in need of review? Have we gone too far? Do we assume too much in a contract and in turn have lost the very important skill of compliance checking? My final point, and it's not very long, will be on academia. Because education is everything. Everything. If you haven't got it, you haven't got civilization. So academia. Notwithstanding my frequent and regular exposure to tertiary labs and tertiary areas in, in Australia and abroad, during the fire and in the recovery from it, I spent a few very happy days in the University of Wollongong Innovation Campus. Amazing. Corrugated iron improvements to graphene and everything in between. Building materials, material research, product development, planning philosophies. Very impressive, incredibly impressive. Indeed, amplifying at every point the strengths and attractions of academia to the young brain, 
challenge, purpose, teamwork and knowledge. But then came COVID and a high unforeseeable hurdle for Australian tertiary institutions as overseas student numbers dried up overnight. Did this expose realities worthy of attention? Don't know, I'm asking the question. Real reliance on foreign students plays a significant part in the economic wellbeing of universities and the communities, particularly regional communities, that support and are supported by the presence of students from abroad and interstate. In turn, did research at universities suffer from heavy reliance upon the economic wellbeing of the parent university? Did it continue as normal? Don't know. Personal observation and experience and conversation would reveal that both economic realities arguably adversely affect the university's reliance, uh, sorry, resilience and in turn their broader community's resilience. Firstly, the people dimension. Is an ever-present cycle of administrative process to seek relatively small research funding grants the best use of our brightest minds? Is the admin burden sufficiently distracting to isolate studies of research, minimise the field of research and preclude thinking time? Is there sufficient sea room to manoeuvre for those reliant upon the time taken for third party approaches, online platform research and operating within budgets for the costs incurred? Are the odds for receiving grants too long in, in the possibility of success or time taken to materialise? How is the ongoing psychological well-being of high performing and proven academics in research roles and endeavours? Are they sufficiently valued? Mixing teaching and research may suit some, but is it the optimum use of a nation's best mind? It's been described to me that I love coffee and I love chocolate, but mocha is dreadful. I'm not sure yet which is teaching and which is research, but I'll leave you to work that out. To three points about the institutions that I've visited. Is it really economically sustainable to not give primacy to research as the seed of deeper and broader knowledge, which in turn keeps the university more attractive to all potential students? Second, it feels to me that universities should be attracting business, not be the business. Third, few universities I have visited feel like corporate headquarters rather than institutions of learning and research. And having said that I would stay away from defence, I believe the closing minutes of this presentation and the rhetorical questions posed is the aperture through which we see our true ability to be self-reliant. Economics and politics have extraordinary freedom of manoeuvre when times are good. I understand that and have been the direct beneficiary of so much of the savings to be had by allowing foreign investment and things to be made overseas. But at what real cost? If looking beyond our shores is the first tendency, then how much of our own talent are we overlooking? How much of our own independence is reliant upon and expecting others to make our horseshoe nails? Thank you. What a fantastic talk. I, uh, I'm a little biased. Vince is a, a very good friend of mine. But um, for someone who uh, has an extraordinary background to move into something that brings his, uh, I think, administration, organisational skills um, to look at a, a regional issue, uh, to go a long way to identify solving it, and then uh, to move into a, a broader, a regional, super regional, international uh, arena, um, taking the concepts and ideas uh, to, the, to the very essence of, I think, the challenges uh, of all of us today, I, I think is quite extraordinary. So uh, you certainly have my thanks, uh, but I cannot admit to being surprised. Uh, m my role is a very simple one, and that is to uh, ask you to, because Vince kept to time. Okay. Um, we, we do have uh, time for, I think, a, a discussion that I hope can r really tease out some of these ideas and perhaps move into some of the directions that uh, Vince is trying to direct us into. Um, I don't want to be asking a question. Oh, look, hands are here. Uh, Vince, that was a fantastic exposition, and thanks so much. Uh, should we give our names? Len, Len Fisher. Uh, in, uh, your example of COVID, uh, going back, I think, to about 2016, we, and I mean the people who are working in network science, laid down a very convincing report on just how to handle a coming pandemic when it came. 
our advice was totally ignored by governments around the world, even though it was the, and it was based on resilience, it was based on recovery. Uh, my real question is how do we get politicians to listen to the people who actually understand? I'm a fearless man, but I wouldn't touch that. Um, I, I can't. Um, I can't. It's an easy one, Vince. It is. You've got to keep chipping away. I asked for an audience with three members, three ministers, federal ministers of our local member, Fiona Phillips, and to her credit, in October last year, she got me three ministers: ministers Watt, McBain, and um, Rowland, interviews in Parliament House on the same day. And I offered them a presentation on the, on the Resilience Project to say, I'm really happy to help you roll it out nationally and I know how to do it. We now know where the errors are. We now know where the weaknesses lie. We know exactly what it costs to build. Of the $2 million grant that we expended on that project, the only money that did not stay in the Shoalhaven was the $180,000 travel costs for the Griffith University to travel to the Shoalhaven from Queensland. Everything else did not leave the area. And, and that captured the local members' imagination because you think, oh, really? So the whole lot stayed here. Yep. And we didn't use a single external contractor. Even the commercial provision of the televisions, though we could get them in Sydney for about four or $500 cheaper, we decided to go with the warranty of purchasing locally and getting the locals to install them. And that, in turn, gave what the Bushfire Local Economic Recovery Fund was all about to get the money into the places. Now, you know, we're talking about mulch recently. The bridge at Nowra has just been rebuilt. The garden beds were, were mulched with mulch from Sydney with a mulching plant only 400 metres as the crow flies from where it was required. Um, that's the sort of thing that I bring to my local members' attention, not in a humorous way, to say this is nuts. Why aren't we... I think, I think the fundamental problem is that Politicians, I think, at the moment are a product of their environment and they are forced to respond to the nearest noise and the worst noise is what's happening across social media. And until we can convince them, look, can you turn that bloody thing off? Just tell us what you think and stick to it. And I promise you, the noise will go. It will, it, I'm not on Facebook. I don't, I don't need to know what people think of me. But the, po the point I'm trying to make is, is that they are responding to the, th the nearest stimulus which creates the greatest political risk for them. We've got to somehow encourage them to have the confidence that we're not looking at that. That's as best I can uh, give just you. Be, um, what, what, the, as we all know, this is a, um, a group of four different uh, societies and we have uh, a number of people in the audience that uh, are really world-class in world... Uh, knowledgeable about uh, nuclear power and what Vince's talk to me was all about was energy and how we can best apply energy in a time in our society that uh, we're under um, a variety of different threats. So I'd really appreciate anyone who may have some questions that relate to energy that may reflect broadly this audience's interests. Yep. Um. Robert, um, this is one of the few occasions where I agree with you. I think that was a really <laughs> great talk, so thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know if you saw, but a few months ago, um, uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard wrote a piece in The Telegraph about um, climate change and energy generation, and his point was that the market will solve the problem, not governments. And I think actually he's right. And if you look what's happened in Australia over the last 20 years, there's been an enormous explosion in um, distributed in energy generation through household solar. I mean, I think just today they said that it's now about the same amount that coal generation provides and it will go up by a factor of three over the next 30 years. And the reason for that is it's so cheap. It's now down to about, you know, 20 US cents a watt. Um, so one of the points you made was that you've got to have resilience and through that uh, you can't be dependent on concentrated supply. So Australia is in a great position for distributed, distributed energy provided we can put storage into place to, um, to do that. Now, if those same sort of technologies can be drawn from, like for example, a mobile phone network to give that greater resilience through it being more um, 
protected against loss of power, for example, then you already have a lot of the sorts of <coughs> parts of the, of the infrastructure in place. Now, it doesn't solve the whole problem, but what we've got to do is to get um, politicians out of the way to the extent that they shouldn't be regulating, but rather they should be facilitating. That's exactly the point I would have raised. The assumption that it's got to be driven by rules and regulation is, I think, perhaps misplaced because it can't embrace the amount of things that are interactive and interconnected. Whereas to your point, if it turns into a facilitation function, so for example, if, if I hadn't had the Telecommunications Act and the need to go through a telco to provide satellite communications to the network I was trying to build, which took a year to come through, even though I told them in the very first interview, I don't know why I'm even talking to you, you don't have a satellite offering and I need satellites. And it doesn't matter, that's, that's the Telecommunications Act of 1984, like it or lump it. Whereas if the Telecommunication Act was one was, which was written in a facilitative way, which said that it's not driven by what you must talk to or who you must address, but more, it's focused on an outcome and allowing you to think how to get to that outcome, then it's, a, I think it's, a, I hate to say it, it's a bit more of the European inquisitorial as opposed to our adversarial. And I think that probably would work better. Um, in terms of the existing infrastructure, caution there, because it's, the reality is the investment in regional Australia is appalling. Um, Sandy and I flew down to see our daughter in Melbourne in our little light bug smasher a few, few weeks ago. It was the first week of October and we went to uh, via Marimbula, uh, sorry, Malakuta for fuel. And Malakuta, you may recall, was the place that had the 3,000 people on the beach waiting to be evacuated. And if someone had told me that when I was in uniform, I'd have laughed. But it happened. And as we were flying into Malakuta to land on, it's got the most amazing terrorist-proof fence. There wasn't a terrorist anywhere. And you, and you taxi up to the fuel bowser and it's got these two beautiful bowsers, one for aviation uh, kerosene for Avtur and one for Avgas. It's got a beautiful four coated gate to go into this beautiful terminal which has got hot cold running water and a shower and drinking water but you can't lodge a flight plan off your mobile phone because you only had two bars of 3G. This was on a Saturday morning in October three and a half years after 4,000 people were on a beach waiting to be evacuated. Now the telcos will say we've done all this great investment mm, beg to differ blue leader they put the money where the return is and if there's no return in a village of 800 people like Malakuta, okay, you might get an extra reflector, but you won't get an amplifier, you won't get a mast which will take you to 5G all year. And the problem with that is as soon as you start getting half a dozen kids on a beach filming themselves with their new kite surf, you've run out of bandwidth. Now that day we had to climb to 5,000 or 3,000 feet and put the thing in by radio. Really? 2024? But it happened. So what I'm getting at is that the infrastructure isn't what we think it is. In the cities, it's pretty good. No question. But once you start getting out of, out of Dodge, you know, I mean, I know there are people sitting in this room who live only 24 minutes drive from the GPO in an area of Sydney up on the, on the Hawkesbury who, um, who don't have, you know, the sort of access to free-to-air or, or proper reception, again, because of the poor return on investment and no real investment in the things that matter. Having said that, if you can't get to that, why can't we have the sorts of satellite access that we should be getting as a national service provider or national service provision rather than something you've got to go and pay $160 or $180 a month to achieve. Now in Western Australia, the West Australian government has just put um, Skylink, Starlink, into all its police cars so that they can respond to rural crime quicker. Uh, okay, so now we're running police through a commercial satellite or satellite constellation which is asynchronous. Um, not entirely all that reliable, but that's because there's just no phone connectivity outside the sort of visual horizon or the line of sight of the main urban and uh, town areas. So it's, I, think, I think the reality is the mobile phone network's not what we need. It's, it's 70s and 80s stuff, and even 5G, past the beer nuts, there's better ways of doing it, cheaper ways of doing it. Let's just buy a few satellites, throw them up there and start using the beams. Not hard. Up the back. Yep. So, Sorry, did that get to the... Did that sort of get it or not really? Thank you. Sorry. So 
Yeah, with my question, um, I'm thinking... Can you speak into the microphone? That's right. Yeah, sure. So with my question, I'm thinking back to when I started uni university, which yeah. was maybe about 10 years ago now. And it was a bit of a, a long journey for me to decide what I wanted to do, but eventually I decided I wanted to get into energy. That was really where I just saw I could make the most impact on the planet Brilliant. kind of thing because I was you know, Brilliant. very driven in that kind of way. Um, I got to the end of my degree and I really wanted to get into nuclear energy, but there's very much an ideology in Australia that it's just can't be done. It's driven largely by politics. So I moved all the way to New South Wales. I worked at Lucas Heights. I tried to push the whole nuclear power thing. Didn't work. I got quite frustrated. And then basically I went back into the renewable space, which I'm okay with. Um, but it's, I guess my question with that long elaboration is to lead to my now frustration is we're talking about resilience and these kinds of things, but we're turning a blind eye to the fact that we're just getting all of our materials from China. So are we going to reshore these kinds of things? Because it seems like a bit of a resilience issue if we're just going to grab all of our energy from China. I think it's a total resilience issue. Um, one thing we don't have, and, and where, where governments could really, be, could really be helpful, is the whole, the whole discussion of net zero is one thing. But that's not to say that in getting to net zero, what we're talking about is an aggregation of a whole bunch of things that get us there. So it might be a bit of, you know, it might still involve coal, guaranteed. It'll still involve petrol, but we want it to involve wind and solar and offshore and nuclear and we've got to work out what is the total aggregation of all those little bits that we can do and to the question here at the front um, it's really important that it's a, it's not only a matter of harvesting the energy you've got to store it now there are ways of doing that with great flow batteries and all sorts of storage systems at our own home we've got two tesla power walls on the on the bolted outside the wall to just make sure the house is largely autonomous but but what i'm getting at is that the resilience is not in looking for the silver bullet and then coming out with a great announcement of, oh, we're all going to go to hydrogen this week. No, the, 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 the solution is to be sufficiently informed and understanding of what we're trying to get to. If the net zero is one thing, then, okay, let's work out how we do that and how many things do we need to do that. And again, to the point up front here, there's a whole bunch of people out there using all sorts of great things with solar and wind and, and, um, and hydro. They're all a part of the equation. Uh, where we come unstuck is where politically what we want is the huge announcement, the big cataclysmic announcement, and, and we're going to go down this path. Now, we did that in Wollongong not so long ago with a hydrogen um, production plant proposal, which died not because the hydrogen production is difficult or impossible to achieve, but because the fact that we had to build a whole bunch of power lines and copper and wires and switching stations to support this new project because you couldn't use what was already there or nearby made it un unaffordable. So the whole thing which was announced with a great fanfare in the Illawarra was just pushed to one side and never heard of again. So to your point, the resilience is, is, has got to be a lot smarter. The resilience can only be achieved if people are thinking with resilience in mind. If the thing is always driven by the buck, there's only one place you can go and that's to the cheapest seller. And it's killing industries in Germany, in Scandinavia, because people are going to the panels that are a tenth the price or a sixth the price of what their own stuff being produced at home. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's the sort of thing where governments have to say, okay, well, you know, this stuff, we actually probably do need to protect some things. Because resilience isn't cheap. It's not cheap. It's more expensive than defense. Please. Uh, thank you for a most interesting and provocative talk. I really uh, congratulate you on thank behalf you. of myself and hopefully others as well. Um, you mentioned throughout your discussion um, uh, the need for firming, that is to ensure that energy is produced while the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. Uh, clearly one of the most um, uh, widespread firming agent is nuclear power. Uh, we in Australia cannot uh, uh, we, we, we cannot uh, benefit from that because we have legislation passed in 1999 which prohibits us ever from going into nuclear. And it would seem that um, uh, if we were to go in that direction, 
the um, uh, we ought to look at uh, small modular reactors. There, there are 19 countries in the world that are in various stages of development for for SMRs, and it would be ideal for us, and it can go down to to um, what they called uh, micro ones uh, under five megawatts, which could be useful in mines. For instance, BHP has been. Uh, asking the government to consider that. So my question is, uh, do you think it would be worthwhile for the government to repeal that legislation so that at least we would be free as a country to examine the merits or otherwise of nuclear power? Personal opinion, I think it's exactly the sort of thing that the government should be better informed and make a logical decision towards understanding what the dimensions of this are. You know, build a little test off and learn a lot. If you just all of a sudden say, no, we're not gonna do any of that. Well, hang on a minute, we're just about to invest a, a gazillion dollars in a nuclear submarine, isn't that nuclear? Or because it's off a wharf, is that okay? You know, it took us 65 years to find wh where the Titanic was and we knew where it was. It only took us 61 years after Orville Wright to land on the moon. The reason is because stuff underwater is very, very, highly technical and much more difficult than rocket science. And yet we're going from a, not being able to assemble a motor car to, to what exactly, building a nuclear submarine, really? And yet we won't allow it ashore where you can control it, where you can harness it, where you can bring it to great effect and great advantage with significant oversight and proper regulation and proper compliance checking. Um, but we're quite happy to risk that in something which other navies have been, has taken 50 or 60 years to master. Big deal. And that's not meant to be a party political broadcast, by the way. Um, but I, I agree I've with got you. A question. I've got a question too. Uh, the other day, Vince, we had a very interesting chat when you were sitting on the windowsill and um, I was more secure. And we were talking about the, the fact that there's a, a sort of range of narratives that are dominating our lives with conflicts between ideas, narrative, science, uh, and there's an interdependence of these. And it reminded me when we put the phone down of a, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Ian Ring, who is one of the leading uh, exponents of uh, Aboriginal health management. And he, he made the point recently that right across the board with Aboriginal health as an example, that the government gives lots of money and it says, here are the objectives, here's the money, and you're the guys who are going to do it. But he made the point, which, which is certainly in my experience in different areas, is they never say how. They don't say, um, or they don't really mean and say, how do you monitor this? And when you identify a breakdown in the transit, uh, how do you intervene and remedy it. And I, I'm just throwing back to you those issues in the really important areas that you've been identifying. How do we monitor it and how do we set up a system to intervene and remedy the breakdown in the transit of ideas to outcomes? A, a really dear friend of mine in uh, Melbourne, a, a wonderful engineer, used to say, nothing's hard if you know what you're doing. Um, and I, I, I carry that with me almost daily because, to your point, Rob, I think the, the, the big problem is, is that if you interfere often enough, you actually start displacing people's minds from, from thinking the problems through and doing the proper second and third order consequences they're building. In other words, build a little, test often, learn a lot. And have you, as you identify risk, you mitigate it, and then you treat the residual to as low as reasonably practicable and keep advancing. The point I'm trying to make there is if you're in the business of research and development, it, that's not the place to start interfering with bureaucratic oversight. That's got to be left to the people that know what they're doing in that space, and that's the engineers and the scientists. Now, if you wanted to put a harness around it, by all means, define the outcome that you wish to seek from the expenditure you're prepared to outlay to get there. And then make sure that their compliance is to the design as specified. Now, we do that in aeroplanes every day of the week. You know, systems are built for aircraft 
and they're tested. And you've seen when it's come unstuck when the boardroom takes over the engineering. Now it happened with the Boeing Seven, uh, the Max. Um, it, it, it's when it's when people that don't really understand what it is we're trying to do start overriding those who do know what they're trying to do. And that's when you come unstuck. Example in very simple terms. Okay, this is a defence story. <laughs> in defence, it's really odd. You get the budget and you say, okay, we, uh, we, want, uh, we want to buy 34 helicopters uh, and they've got a budget of $9.2 million. And you go to the nearest helicopter company and you say, oh, we got $9.2 billion and we, uh, we want 34 helicopters. How much do you reckon that's going to cost? Oh, uh, $9.2 billion? Look at that. We're on budget. But then it turns into a, we want to deliver this by such and such a time frame. And the time frame of the delivery is actually dictated to by the political outcome. But then you get the engineer who says, well, hang on, no, it's going to take four years to do that. No, no, that can't be right. It says two years here. No, no, it's four years. No, no, it says two years here. And then in two years, they say, oh, look, we're two years behind. But the engineer told you that at the start. It's going to take you four years to do it. You know, I've got a lot of time for engineers. I've spent a lot of my life off the ground. These hands have had the privilege and the joy of starting some of the world's most amazing engines. And I never once thought for a second that I was getting into something that I wasn't going to get out of. And it's because you have confidence in the people that know what they're doing, doing what they're supposed to do, understanding what their outcome is. We want this thing to deliver 1,650 shaft horsepower and they build it. And that's why, going back to academia and engineering, you know, education is everything. If you start skimping on the ability of people to research new ideas, don't be surprised when they come with the same solutions to the problems that, you know, of yesteryear. So... Two I'm more not, questions. I'm not, I'm not a fan of over, uh, over, over eating the custard. Thank you, Vince, for your pitch on engineers. Um, I, I, I'm an engineer. Martin Thomas is my name. Hello, Martin. I was privileged to work with uh, Ziggy Switkowski in 2006 yeah. on the what was called the Uranium Task Force. Yes. Uh, we thought it was all done in 2006, and we came up with a recommendation for a mix of technologies, those that you've mentioned, which are very attractive, and also nuclear power. Uh, Pre-SMRs, as the gentleman in front of me has mentioned the attractiveness of then. This room has probably 15 or 20 individuals in it who are well known to each other, who have been persistent in our efforts to promote this idea for a a very well ever since 2006 and beyond people knowing much much more than I do mostly engineers scientists and so on but we have failed miserably the nuclear power as you would well know is illegal in this country is the removal of that legal constraint the horseshoe nail that we need and if so with your skills of dealing and and managing a whole raft of different types of people, which we engineers are not so good at. You've dealt with a lot of people to get an outcome in a double quick time, which probably to many seemed impossible. Vince, how do we go about getting that horseshoe nail of legality so we can at least think about nuclear in this wonderful country? Wow. Uh, firstly, can I congratulate the nuclear engineers in the room uh, it's fantastic. I mean, it, um, I think the fundamental problem is we've made it too complicated. It's got this mystique about it, and all, all it is is about boiling water. <laughs> it's boiling water. I, I, I can either use a sp split an atom to boil a kettle, or I can go over here and use <clears throat> coal. <laughs> so, rub sticks together. Yeah. Rub sticks together. I mean, it's just about boiling water. And, and it, you know, the fundamental in issue here is nuclear has terrific potential for us. But if you look at the financial models that we use to understand how we do stuff, the fundamental problem is not applying nuclear. The fundamental problem is how much water can you boil? How big does that thing have to be? If we were to change every coal-fired power station <coughs> now with a magic football sponge by hitting the, the switch on the wall... OK, you're all now nuclear. We've got exactly the same problem because we're boiling the same amount of water. So there's... To me, the mystique is, is, is bizarre because it's not that difficult a concept. And there are countries that have been doing it 
for decades. And, you know, people say, oh, what about the crisis of Fukushima? Hang on, whoa, whoa, Fukushima, engineering and technologically, was a resounding success because it survived. So, you know, let's, let's talk about real stuff. What about Chernobyl? Well, OK, I can't speak for the Russians, but I know exactly what nuclear submariners have to go through in the United States just to be allowed on a boat. The level of uh, training, examination, cross-examination, interview. There used to be a guy called Rick over in the United States who used to have them all to dinner, and if you didn't impress him at dinner, you didn't get on a boat. Now, I mean, that's a bit excessive, but, hey, it's that sort of fanaticism that makes sure it keeps the thing under control and sensible. But to your point, how do you get the message across? Just, you know, when these micro, when these micro generators will eventually, you know, come into more popular and open use, and we start seeing that it's actually not a difficult way to generate energy and it's quite harnessable and quite controllable, I think you'll start seeing people saying, well, what, would have been, what, what are we concerned about exactly? So, again, technology is going to catch up and, uh, and people will start seeing the, uh, the wood for the trees. We're going to have to move on. I know Chrissy's got a very quick Hi, question and then uh, our president is going to... Um, Vince, I, I'm not really expecting you to answer this, but to what extent does the lack of resilience in power and communications in the regions of Australia in um, undermine our ability to defend ourselves? Oh, uh, that's a great yeah. question. It's a great question. Um, Do, I mean, does it? It does. Yeah, okay. And if you have a look, if you have can a look you at... Can you solve it by, by the Shoalhaven model? Uh, no. <laughs> no. But you can certainly go a long way towards keeping the community informed and better resilient more resilient. And would that be a better way to use however much money is going into all of these new naval? I don't think you can split them or separate them. But your, your point is well made. Australia's premier armaments depot is at Eden. Now, there's no railhead. There's no serious highway to it. The only one in and out is the Prince's Highway. And it was put there because effectively Eden Monero was a bellwether seat and it was jobs and so on and so forth. But it's got a shared wharf at Twofold Bay. It's a common user facility for our premier armaments depot. Almost all of the capability in defence terms is in the regions. You know, the airfields, the big army bases, you know, the naval bases are about the only things that are close to major uh, nice places to live. But even HMAS Albatross, the naval air station, the world's most advanced helicopter base, by the way, true story. Um, lives, you know, sort of two and a half hours from Sydney. So all of the all of the concentrations of defence capability are in places where the community resilience, I would argue, is the least. So, do I actually need, you know, gun emplacements and tin hats? No. What I actually need is to know that those people can a communicate, b have the power to live, c if they need more power, it's there. Um, you know, and I hear some of the discussions going on around around various sources of energy and the and the opposition people have to them. You say, but but you know, we can't keep sipping latte and admiring this problem. We don't have enough energy. And the fact is, you can't go to the beach in the summer in in Nowra or in the Jarvis Bay and be able to call your your spouse to say, "I'm going to be half an hour late for lunch," because all the bandwidth's gone. Well, you know, we're a first world country, aren't we? I think we sadly, sadly, we, we've got to be out of here by eight. And I'm just saying thank you, Vince. That was outstanding. And Susan will say that in a much more comprehensive way. But anyway, so Vince, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, for a wonderful uh, trip through the Shoalhaven and uh, through a whole lot of uh, provocative issues related to energy and resilience. So please join me again in thanking Vince. Yes, and please join Vince on the tour through Italy in April next year. Uh, thanks again to uh, Academy Travel for, uh, for sponsoring tonight.